Hello, and welcome to episode 40 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. How is it up there? It's overcast and slightly rainy, and there's flu season germs going around everywhere. Mostly at your house, it seems like. Ground zero. Mostly at my daughter's school. Oh. So that's where she picked it up, and then she brought it home, gave it to my wife, and now they're trying to give it to me, and I am not allowing for that. So I'm out here recording this. Well, as Elon Musk says, alcohol is a solution. Maybe maybe the drink today will help stave off some of the germs. <laughs> What are you drinking today, John? What am I drinking today? Maybe you should start, actually. We'll go in that order. I was just going to say that. Uh. I should start first. I'm (laughs) drinking something that I have had previously on this show, and that is uh, a gin-based drink. It is a Tom Collins. So that's uh, featuring botanist gin, which I think is among, I said this before, among the tastier gins that are out there. I'm not a huge gin fan, but I liked it. And the Tom Collins fits perfectly with what uh, our musical theme is. Yeah. As on that note, what are you we'll drinking? we'll see what I'm drinking. I'm drinking a, a cocktail called the Sawyer. And I'll make – it's another gin-based drink. I'm actually drinking Bombay Sapphire gin. Uh, another good one. Yeah, but it's really mild. Um, I love gin. Gin doesn't always love me. Gin's one of the few liquors that really makes me like loopy drunk. Uh, oh. So, I have to be careful. Two martinis, I'm good. Three martinis, I need like a child seat. Basically. I didn't know this. Yeah, I don't know what it is, man. Something about my constitution and gin. They don't mix. I can drink whiskey till the sun comes up. I know that. Yeah. I knew you knew that. <laughs> I think maybe do you don't drink gin with me because you're like, okay, this is going to be more than three drinks. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would go out with my ex-girlfriend and I'd order a gin martini and you could just see the fear in her eyes. Just terror. <laughs> like, she, she was like, it's one of those nights. <laughs> like, Tears oh, no. would start coming down her cheeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sawyer cocktail. Let me, let me also pat myself on the back here by saying that I went out and got some ingredients. Or more specifically, I had some ingredients delivered. <laughs> 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 because this is a drink that requires a little bit of mixology to it. Uh, it's gin, lime juice, some simple syrup, and three types of bitters. Now, here's where I, I went. A slightly more John root. I only got one type of bitters. I just went with Angostura. Yeah. But this is a drink with more than one thing in it. It's well, pretty it's, good for me. It's a mixology cocktail, yeah, yeah. clearly coming from like some New York City restaurant or bar yeah. that's high end. Yeah. And after practicing making these all day Sunday, <laughs> I can now report, make three of them at a time. Yeah. I can now report that I've got a pretty good handle on it. What happens with you with tequila? Um, I get really happy. Okay. And, and then, I don't know if I should say the rest of this sentence, but usually I find my clothes somewhere the next day. <laughs> Hopefully in your closet, but yeah, I know exactly. that's not what you mean. Hung up neatly. That's funny. <laughs> Tequila gives me like uh, clarity at like three or four in the morning. So, it doesn't wow. – it gets me, but it's usually like a very clear-headed kind of uh, effect that it has on me. It's very strange. It's weird how all of these things really come down to ethanol and at the same time how it's manufactured makes such a difference. It is strange. Yeah. Now, if you add those two drinks together- Your Tom um, and my Sawyer. Yeah. What do we get? <laughs> well, we get one of Rush's best songs, Tom Sawyer. Why Rush? Why is our song today by the band Rush? I will say this. It is unlikely in general that we would have chosen a Rush song except for an event of this level. Yeah. And it's not that I don't like Rush. I'm just not- um, I'm not a huge Rush fan, especially after, like, I don't know. They've had so many albums, it's impossible. But after they did, like, Moving Pictures, I lost uh, the ability to, like, really track them. What was but their big, like, big one, 2112? Wasn't that their big one? Their yeah, but album? that was no, – Moving Pictures, which is what uh, the song Tom Sawyer is from, was their biggest album, yeah. at least as I understand it. I know this conversation really speaks to our demographic, our listener demographic. <laughs> Classic rock, yeah. a Canadian band. Right. Let's explain why we're talking about it. And that is, is that Neil Peart, who was the drummer for Rush and uh, an extraordinary musician and certainly something that is, that's widely agreed upon among musicians, he died this week in California, I believe is, is where it happened. And uh, so we thought we'd pay a little homage to him by choosing one of their songs. And this is their biggest hit. Yeah. And I, I remember the first time I heard it where it's got that kind of like heavy, uh, you know, guitar 
sound right at the beginning. And then if you listen to his drumming behind it, it's really quite extraordinary. At first, you don't really realize how good it is. And then as you yeah. go through it, you're like, this guy's drumming up a, a storm. So, of course, I listened to the songs off that album the other night, listening specifically to the drums. And I was like, this guy, I'd forgotten how good he was. Yeah, so He's, I mean, one of the greatest drummers of all time. Probably the most elaborate drum kit of all time. If you get an aerial view on Neil Peart's drum kit, is it Peart or Peart? I always thought it was Peart, but maybe I it's thought Peart. It was Peart. Yeah, well, if you get. I mean, he's got forty drums in a circle around him, and hi hats, and I mean, you name oh, it. Oh, it was incredibly. That was an octopus involved. <laughs> <laughs> we but just anyway, call him the octopus. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, R.I.P. Neil, you'll be missed. Next time, I swear we're going to go with something a lot more modern, contemporary, bring in some da baby or something like Fair that. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we talk about the present, let's talk about the LSAT world. What's been going on there? Well, I mean, I think mostly what we're going to just focus on today is LSATs themselves. There's another LSAT coming in February. Um, February 22nd, in fact, is the next one on the calendar. If you haven't registered for that test yet, tough luck. The registration deadline was January 7th. So, again, if you're not registered for February, you got to start eyeballing March as your next attempt, whether you took it in January or not. The registration deadline for the March 30th test is February 11th which happily, as we'll talk more about, is five days after the January scores are going to come out. So if you just took the January test, you'll at least have your results in time to register for March if that's what you want to do. Yeah, this is really where the wheel starts turning. Mm -hmm. We just had the January LSAT, which is going to be our main focus today. Then you've got February, then you've got March, and then you've got April. <laughs> Stop it. I know. It's great. And then you get to take a month off, John, I'm talking about <laughs> recently I released. I genuinely might you know, recently administered LSATs. And then you will have LSATs thereafter in June, July, August, September, October, and November. And then you get another break for the holidays, LSAC uh, generously allowing us the opportunity to not have to deal with a new test every month. And right now, the big question that we're getting from everybody is, what about the test dates? When are they going to release them? The number one question I've actually had is, is there any more LSATs? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, there are more LSATs coming. Um, they didn't just up and leave. Like Shuttering so the windows in, yeah, in June. They were so mad at our criticism, they took their toys and they went home. Uh, no, we talked to them before the holidays and we're pressing them on this. And they're well aware of the fact that the uh, release of these dates is late. But one of the things that happened last year was that their scheduling – I think caused them some issues, especially November was scheduled during Thanksgiving week. And I think that turned out to be a huge mistake in hindsight. Uh, I feel very confident in saying that they will not be having an LSAT during Thanksgiving week uh, this time around. And so I think what they've been trying to do is to make sure that they get it as right as possible. They had said to us at that time, we will release the dates in early January. It is now January 14th. And so we expect them this week. Uh, I don't know if I'd call this early. Mm -hmm. This is mid-January to me mid, now. Yeah. But uh, we do expect them this week, and then that should provide us with the rest of the test dates through the end of 2020. And then later on, I expect they'll release some more of the 2021 dates, but I don't yeah. think we're going to get all those for sure. Can I circle back to something you said that got me all excited for a minute? Okay. You said in May you get a month off. Did you mean from the LSAT or – from work. <laughs> I could honestly see myself on a beach for a month in May. You know, I love the LSAT. It's pretty obvious. Anybody who uh, talks to me on places like Reddit or our forum or Twitter or what have you, uh, I'm happy to help always and I really do enjoy it. But when there's an, a test every month, it, it strikes a bit of fear in my heart because it starts meaning that I think students will take it a little bit more casually. They're like, oh, I can just take next month if this one doesn't work out. And also, I have still a lot of fear, uh, perhaps one might say trauma, from what happened at the end of last year with all the problems, which I think were in part caused by having so many tests and having them just basically spill over onto each other. So it's not that I'm unhappy that they have all these LSATs. I'm just unhappy about what I feel like the implications of that could actually be. Yeah, the logistics of it could get a little tangled, as we've, we've seen. Already, yeah, I mean, it's it's not even a proven point at this point, right? Uh, and we'll talk a little more about the nature of that as it related to the test from Monday. But 
let's look back. We're talking forward. Let's look back. What we've actually seen over the past, well, as of this recording, four days, uh, are three different LSATs administered. There was one on Saturday, the 11th, in Europe and other places. There was another one on January the 12th, which was Sunday. That was the Asia test, and I think Australia was part of that, New Zealand, various places. Yep. And then, of course, the big one, the one we'll focus on today, was the North American test that was Monday the 13th. Uh, and that's going to be really the central point of this discussion. Well, let's talk really quickly about the Europe and the Asia, as I'll abbreviate. I know there were other places, but the tests on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, from what I can tell, appears to be a new test. In other words, I couldn't match it up. I couldn't find its you know, prior existence elsewhere. It wasn't an old February. It wasn't, from what I could tell, another international test or Sabbath test or something like that. It seems to be new content, which is fine. It's kind of boring to talk about, but fine. It was there. Yeah. It seemed to be fair. I didn't hear a lot of people saying anything crazy happened, which was good. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, excellent, they're about to do a deep level deconstruction of that <laughs> European test from Saturday. Sorry. So sorry to disappoint. Of course, there's another larger group of people who are like, yes, I don't want to hear about it. However, if you're interested in some of the details from that test, we do have it on our LSAT discussion forum. Mm -hmm. And we always make a post and then people will ask us questions about it. And we'll post up some of the information that's there about logic games and reading comprehension just to give you a sense of, you know, that what the test that you took was indeed what everybody else took. So if you're looking for information on the European or the Asian test, that is on our forum. Uh, it's not prejudicial in any way. It just gives you mostly topics that are there. So check yeah. that out if you get a chance. Yeah, we'll link to it. It's also under general questions, just on the main forum page, the discussion forum. Here's the fun part, though. Sunday's test. You're excited about this. Yes, I man. This got me all fired up. Uh, <laughs> Sunday was the test in Asia, but of course, I was hearing about it here on Saturday night. Um, and I actually stayed in on a Saturday night and just talked to people about this test and tried to help them out you know, time differences and whatnot. The reason this test got me so fired up is it is finally the reuse. You've been talking about this. I've been talking about this for like a year, probably, of the February 2017 LSAT. The North American test from February 2017 was used in its entirety, finally, in Asia on Sunday. Which made it really easy for us to identify. Yeah, was... I think you knew it almost immediately. And I, I'm sure that right now there's some people saying, wait a second, they reused the test? Yes, this is standard procedure. Nothing unusual or sinister has happened. Uh, when they create tests and then they give them to a group of test takers and the results are not disclosed, just like with Monday's January test here, uh, that gives them a great option and that is to reuse those tests later. Maybe they could reuse it for uh, you, you know, a European international test at some point, and then a year after that, use it in Asia as an unreleased test, and then they could bring it back to the United States a couple of years later and do that. And we see these, you know, kind of like streams of history. Obviously, one of our jobs here, at least we see it as our job, I'm not sure anyone else does, is to track that usage. And it helps us kind of shape some of the things that we predict in our crystal balls and, and some of the advice that we give to students. So, this is not something unusual. It's not cloak and dagger. The reuse is normal. We've actually been waiting for it. So I think when it happened, John was like, finally, yeah. I've been waiting to see this test. I'm a little bit disappointed myself because I was kind of hoping they would use it in one of it was these spring tests. Yeah, it was yeah. bittersweet for me too. I was like, man, use it bigger. But what this does allow them to do is use it again. The fact that they've used it only internationally at this point means it's coming to North America at some point. Most likely next year is what my thought would be. Next year or the year after is when we will probably see that. Now, this is why I say it's non-prejudicial. Even knowing that, even if we're 100% right about that, as an LSAT taker later on, that you know, next year or the year after, does that give you some type of advantage? Nope. Unfortunately not. It might give you the opportunity to see some things and be like, hey, I remember hearing about this passage. But it's really – there's so many passage options, you, you just wouldn't remember anything about it. There's not enough details, um, you know, by design for anybody to actually be able to figure anything out and get an advantage because that would not be fair, at least by the rules of the game and, and we're going to adhere to that. Yeah, for sure. Now, this was more of just like a private personal excitement as opposed to like, oh boy, anybody who's listening got a huge leg up. It wasn't that. 
Well, since you weren't out on a date on Saturday night, that was probably the most private personal excitement you were going to get, right? Yeah, speaking of a leg up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Let's talk about Monday. If you can leave yourself wide open for shots up. like that, you know I'm taking them. <laughs> Oh, it's so fun. I love it. I know you do. All Here's right, let's move on. Right. So the test on Monday, the North American exam that was given, and obviously I think this speaks to the majority of our audience here. Let's talk a little bit about just the administration itself before we get into the test. Fair? That's what we always do. Yeah. And I think it's a really good starting point. The last time we had one of these conversations, um, in fact, the last two times, it was in relation to the November exam. The main November administration in 2019 was, the, in my opinion, and I think uh, yours as well, and I think we're the definitive experts on this, was the worst LSAT administration in history, mm -hmm. at least the last 30 to 40 years that I've ever read about or heard about or, or, or seen. It was an utter disaster, so much so that they did a makeup test that we then actually had to do episodes on. Yeah. And it was just a real mess. And at that time, we talked about, do you think January will be as bad? And I think I was a little more optimistic than you were, as I recall. I was like, I'm really hoping they, they now have the time. They have a month off. I think that they'll improve things. And I think you were like, more wait and see. Yeah. Which is not I an think, unreasonable position. I don't remember the exact quotes, but yours seemed to be more along the lines of, I don't think it'll be as bad. And mine was like, I hope it won't be as bad, which again is <laughs> a little more tempered and yeah, pessimism. closely. We're not too far apart there. The good news on the overall is that it was not anywhere as bad as yeah. what happened in November. Yeah. I think you said something earlier that uh, resonated with me. And so I'll give the credit to you on this. You were like, this was the best digital test administration so far. Agreed. Yeah. It's I know. I mean, I said it, so obviously agreed, but. I agree with myself. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you in the in the mirror every day. That's right. John, you're looking good. Yes, you are. Yeah, you are, buddy. Uh, I know you're <laughs> right about this. I am right about it. Uh, no, I do think you're correct on that. And I think that's a really good observation overall because for many people, there was a degree of fear. Now, unfortunately, there still were problems. I heard about a lot of small minor issues that I thought to myself, you know what, I'm not going to talk about that. And I started, a, a, I hate to call it a tradition, but it has been recently <laughs> on Twitter of like when I hear of major, what I call catastrophic issues where people can't take the test or there's just massive delays. I've been posting Twitter threads on that. And yesterday, there were four main ones. I could have added a fifth to it and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But that's far better than what we had back in November where the number was somewhere around 20 major incidents. So, uh, yeah, I think we really, figured 8 to 10% basically of test centers. Yeah, in November. It was much better this time around. And so, as far as LSAC is concerned, congratulations to them. Now that you've had a good step forward, this is my advice. Fix the rest of it. Because it wasn't perfect and there were problems at certain centers that now I'm starting to get the feeling they're almost like snake bit. There's at least two centers that are, <laughs> I don't know, cursed by Haunted. LSAT ghosts. Haunted. <laughs> Haunted by someone who didn't do well and comes back and screws over everybody else. Not to but, scare people away from these centers, but there has been a worrying trend. Um, I'll let you name them and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happened. Yeah, we'll get to them. Yeah. So, why do you think there were fewer problems overall? What's your take on that? Um, number one, this was a much smaller administration. I think it was about thirteen to 14,000 fewer people compared to November. Uh, the timing of it was a little better. Like you say, Thanksgiving week is just complicated. Uh, and this one obviously was just, you know, they would apparently they would call it early January. I would say it was in mid-January. <laughs> but <You'd, clears throat> yeah, fewer centers, fewer test takers. And, you know, look, I, they've obviously learned from their mistakes to some degree. Well, I think also back in November, they gave fair warning that there were problems. And they said, look, we've had a proctor uh, company or a proctor vendor breakdown where we've received notice yeah. very uh, close to the actual test that a number of proctors would not be available. And so back in November, we saw... Uh, a large number of, of incidents where the proctor just didn't show up. This time, I'm only aware of that happening in one place. And it was to a really small group of people. I don't know if it was one or two or three, 
But as far as I'm aware, that only happened in a single location. And so that actually speaks, I think, to the truth of what they were saying when they were like, look, okay, look, we're, we're LSAC. We're responsible for this. But we've had a vendor who we thought we could rely on basically screw us over. And to fix it to the extent that they did, I think probably suggests that they were telling the truth. And we said at that time, their transparency was really, really nice that they let people know it sucked what happened, but at least there was some understanding of what was occurring. It looks to me like this time they were able to get their ducks in a row and fix that. And of course, as you said, they, they've had like, uh, you know, six weeks, seven weeks since the last LSAT to work on the known issues with the supply chain of, of tablets and books, as well as the Proctor issue. And it showed. Yeah. Fewer test takers, uh, a little bit of time. They did a much better job this time around. You know, credit to them for learning a lesson, at least. They had to have learned the lesson. Yeah. I know there's smart people over there. I know they really want it to work well. So I, when the first problem rolled in, I just I remember I put my head down on the desk and I was like, do I pound my head hard right now or just softly? Because I don't know how much worse it's going to get. And fortunately, I, it wasn't too bad. And I've said to the people over at LSAC, it's like, I don't like reporting this stuff. It's not some kind of private joy for me, but it's got to be done because, man, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And the more you hear about it, the more likely they are to really focus their resources and efforts on fixing it. So we're moving in the right direction. What I want to see in February is even fewer, hopefully no problems. Although yeah. I, think I hope no one's under really the tough. impression that we like revel in their mistakes. That's most certainly not the case. I, I revel in student success. Their yeah. mistakes are prohibitive to that. So no, I'm, I'm glad when things go right. Uh, and for the most part, they did here. So again, full credit to those guys. Yeah, you still well, had a number of small High issues. partial credit to those guys. High partial credit, yeah. This is, uh, what do you think, B plus? Is that, did you grade it there? Hmm. B? Maybe B. I might go B plus, but I think I'm being biased by the fact that November was an F. <laughs> yeah. You're grading on a bad curve here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll make that determination when we get to the, the bad problems. Were there small issues? Yes. There were still th issues with like delayed tablets, problems syncing certain people in. There were some delayed check-in times, although not as many of the four-hour delays that we heard about before. There were issues with proctors who still didn't know the rules and regulations involving like tablet angle. Uh, I had one, one guy write me on Twitter and he's like, I listened to what you said about printing that out and you know taking it with your admission ticket and I didn't do it. And then I was kicking myself <laughs> when I was sitting there and finally I convinced the proctor that, look, this was legit and uh, I wasn't making it up. So all the little problems that we had before were still there, but... Since they did not materially affect your ability to take the test, I mean, delays of 30 to 40 minutes, that happened in the old days. Mm -hmm. I can live with that. Don't like it, but I don't consider that something where I'm like, you guys have got to get better. So I'm just going to let all that stuff go. There were a few, yeah, there were a few places. When we talk about like real problems here, what we're talking about is all out catastrophe. Like you don't have a those. test day, basically. Yeah. Yeah. The first one of the day came out of Missouri and Joplin, Joplin, Missouri. Apparently there were two rooms at this test center. One of them was just fine. They were able to just roll right through the test. You know, everybody walks out, they're happy. In the other room, they had the classic, the tablets will not connect to the system. And after a while, they're like, nothing we can do. You guys are canceled. So cancel culture in full effect. Uh, in Joplin, Missouri, as half one of the rooms had to go home. And that was the very first one that I heard about. That's one where I put my head on the desk and I was like, please, not oh, the no, same. Don't let this continue. Same exact thing happened in Memphis, Tennessee, by the way. Tablets wouldn't sync. Everybody sent home. That, as we'll talk a little more about, is one of the two centers that seems to be plagued. Memphis has got an LSAT ghost because <laughs> the story behind an Memphis was... An evil LSAT ghost, not Casper. This was the location where there's two different Marriott's or something and they were sent to one, but then all the material went to the other and they had it backwards and there was no rooms reserved at the one they sent all the students to. That was a whole different situation in Memphis with some accommodated test takers. The, the okay. test takers and the proctors were given the wrong address. <laughs> just... The tablets were sent one to Marriott and they went to another and the Marriott was like, we don't have your stuff. 
dropping my grade from B plus to B right now. There you go. That grade inflation was kicking in for a minute. I didn't like it. <laughs> this is grade school stuff. Don't make that <laughs> mistake. Uh, yeah, Memphis has had a lot of problems in November, and I think it was was it September as well had issues. I think so. so October for sure. I know they had a cancellation in uh, in Memphis. A little bit of a problem. Uh, the second issue that I heard about was in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. at the Hilton. And they had the same type of issue where the tablets wouldn't link or verify or sync up. In this case, it took about two hours and they did a really interesting thing. They gave people the option of either staying or leaving. And according to our source, about half the people left and about half stayed and took it, you know, roughly. And so the person I was talking to obviously left because it was relatively early in the day. It was like, look, two hours, I was frazzled, everybody was on edge. I just knew that I wasn't going to have a great performance. And of course, this is the problem when you have issues like this. It creates an environment where you're really trying to take a test which is about to have a determinative effect on your future. And the circumstances are not just not optimal. They're far from optimal. They're bad. And so when you start getting emotionally involved in that, you really want to get out of there if possible. And that's exactly what happened. So in, at least in one of the rooms, they had an issue again, and that meant that some people couldn't take the test or didn't really want to take the test. Yeah, that was at the Hilton there in Austin. I don't know that I've ever seen them do this, like half measure, where stay or leave, your call. We don't know how long it's going to take to get these to sync. We might be able to get it to work if you want to wait it out with us. Or if you want to go, they'll give you a makeup. Like it's usually all or nothing, from what I've seen. I believe this has got to be a policy um, response to what happened in November. Like, what do we do here? Because telling people they've got to sit there for two, three, four hours without and a guarantee of any results, from what I understood, it wasn't like, hey, these are just sinking really slowly, but we'll get there. Yeah, but if you're forced to sit there for four hours and they're like, no, you can't leave because, you know, it might work and now you have to take the test, the environment is so negative yeah. and I feel like they got a lot of flack for that. So, they probably said, look, if somebody wants to leave after that kind of problem, you let them leave and we'll schedule a makeup and we'll just, for now, deal with the issue. I think that's a smart switch on their part. I do too. So, I, again, you know, thumbs up to that. Yeah. The rest of the issues that I saw were more, um, well, there is one other cursed place. We're not done yet. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> there were a couple of issues that were more singular. Like I know one accommodated test taker in Kentucky, for instance, um, just didn't get the materials sent. I'm supposed to take a paper test. The paper booklet wasn't sent. The person drives two hours, had issues in September as well, and just sits there and nothing. There's no test to take. Well, think about it. It's funny. I've been talking to her not just yesterday a bunch, yeah. but uh, this morning as well. Uh, I had um, further conversation with her. She's been rescheduled now uh, within a week, which is really – We'll talk more least, about the reschedules at the end of this. Yeah, which is good. But the thing – you look at just in isolation, it's one person. You think, well, that's no big deal. No, this isn't her first go around. She already had a problem. She was taking this test for free because of the problems before. It's on a Monday, right? So she's taking off work. All right, lost wages. Two hour drive and two hours back. Well, that's four hours there. The same thing happens now where there's no uh, test taking materials for her. So they're like, I think their initial thing was come back Friday. And she's like, You want me to miss more work, drive four more hours? Uh, no. And I think she was able to work it out. So she's taking it on the weekend. But you can see how the hidden expense of this, we're just talking about like lost time, lost money, lost wages. Emotionally, she's now looking at it. And she's like, uh, I've got a situation with applications coming up and deadlines. She's getting worried about that. And quite sure. rightly so. I felt really bad. I was like, let's hope that we can get this worked out so that you don't have that issue. The emotional toll of going through that, it, it's immeasurable. I mean, we've worked with LSAT students for years and years. And one of the things we all know is that as the LSAT approaches, the level of tension, the pressure just is astronomical and people are very, very edgy. Then to have this kind of stuff happen, it's just, it feels like emotional devastation to me. Yeah. I can't imagine going to the test and in the back of my mind thinking, I wonder if I'm going to take it. That's weird. You know? 
Everything in my it. head when I go to take the LSAT is how I'm going to perform, what I'm going to do when I take it. Not, I wonder if any of this process or thought, you know, preparation even matters today. Well, yesterday so LSU and Clemson played in the national championship. Can you imagine if they got to the, you know, the stadium at like three o'clock in the afternoon and they're like, you guys might play tonight. And right. then they just sat there and the game time came. And instead of running out and being like, we're ready to go. We've been focused towards this exact hour, uh, you know, for the last, you know, couple of weeks. They're like, it may be a couple hours, guys. Just right. sit around and wait. The footballs what? haven't gotten here yet. Let's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the field isn't ready. Right. What kind of game would we get out of there? I mean, it ended up being a great game last night or at least a really interesting one. Uh, but – I, it's the same kind of thing. They just this is abnormal and it is a negative, and this is what I want fixed. Yeah. Where's the uh, the other center that just cannot seem to escape issues? The ghost at the LAX Marriott is particularly uh, poisonous. This is and the Los angry. Angeles Airport Marriott. Yes, LAX, Los LAX. Angeles International uh, Airport. There's a Marriott there. And there's been numerous problems at this center from delays. <clears throat> when they came back to take makeups, there were delays. Yeah. This time they came back from section four and their tablets had already been activated. And so uh, the proctor was reading directions and everybody's looking down and they're like, 20 seconds gone, 25 seconds gone. And of course, I think I read this on Reddit. Somebody said that uh, one of the people in the room screamed. <laughs> 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 I'd probably scream too. It sounds hilarious. Yeah, as, as a you come third back party. from the break. You're trying to like regather your thoughts. Section four is about to start. Section four's already started. What? How you is look this? down. You're like, ah. uh, I can completely understand that person screaming. You know, just kind of like, what the hell is going <laughs> on? Uh, and so my laughter is really more kind of like commiseration there. And certainly not laughter at the situation. Which again, no, it's sucks. laughing so we don't scream. I think. But the, the person, the account that I was reading of that said, yeah, it wasn't optimal. I probably left a couple of points on the table. And that phrase um, really hit me hard because I was like, this is really the best way of kind of like capturing this. Forget all the stuff about like the lost time, lost wages, the expenses, the emotional toll. There is a material impact at the end of the day. This person's like kind of casually saying I left a couple of points out there. A couple of points can make a huge difference in terms of where you get into school and the type of financial offers you get. And this is what they cannot calculate. That could actually have a dramatic impact on that person in a way that really can never be measured. Now I'm starting to think I should go from B to B minus. <laughs> we'll see. Well, the next dis part of discussion here might actually uh, – bring your spirits back up. It might inflate the grade back a bit. Um, I do want to make one final point, echo really one final point, something you and I have talked a lot about, talked about in the last episode, which is you have to essentially mentally prepare yourself for all of these worst case scenarios. What happens when my tablet freezes? What am I going to do? What happens if my proctors don't know the rules or are talking? God, I heard that from so many people about proctors, um, I do, yeah. which is just uh, frankly obscene. It's inexcusable. What happens if I'm sitting there for 45 minutes or an hour or two hours? What am I going to do? Prepare yourself for all of these things. And then when they do happen, you're ready and you've got a plan. When they don't happen, you feel almost lucky. It feels yeah. like today is my day. You're ready to go and now it's a positive right. that things went as expected. Whereas before it was just like... Well, things went better than expected, which is really the point. True. Yeah. It's been, you know as they should go becomes a big positive right. versus what they were previously, which was as they should go was like, yeah, whatever. That's just the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. When people see these things happen and they're like, oh no, I'm like, why wasn't your response like classic? And you just push right through it. Typical LSAC. And you just keep on chucking. <laughs> That's what mine would be. Like, oh God, look at this tablet glitchy. Hey, 45 minute yeah, delay. Hey, Proctor, come here. Knew they would do this to me. Right. Yep. Oh, so we're sitting here for another hour? I'm glad I brought this snack. The thing I will point out, though, is, is that what bothers me about that attitude, and it's the right attitude to have, and, and you and I have preached it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we've said that. But what it represents is a lowering of the bar, a lowering of the standards, where all of a sudden we're supposed to accept that a test that we have to pay 200 bucks to take, let alone all the additional fees for like applying to schools and CAS and all that stuff, 
we're now supposed to walk in expecting that there will be problems. And I think, you know, when we have complained about this, this is what we have said is this is not acceptable. Not for something of this importance. Yeah. We're not talking about making churros or, or chili dogs or something like that where, all right, that wasn't the best churro I ever had, but whatever. <laughs> This is Strange something example. that has a big effect. <laughs> one bad churro and I'm like, well, that was a disappointment, but the next one will be better. You don't get that opportunity with a test like this. And of course, I agree with you. But that's really the shift from like practice to principle. In practice, you have to have this attitude. In principle, the fact that you have to have this attitude is frankly disgusting. Agreed. So, we've talked a little bit about, you know, all, all those problems aside – Go in with that type of attitude. And as we've said, it is getting better. Mm -hmm. There were fewer issues this time. And for those people who had problems and weren't able to take the test, one of the things we've already noticed is that the communication timeline has been a lot faster this time around. And this is, again, this gives me confidence. It gives me more hope because last time we made multiple public complaints about the fact that you just can't leave people for a week with no idea when they're taking the test. You can't just say, we'll contact you at a future date to figure out when you're taking the, the exam. Uh-uh. This time they, they got that message. Uh, and I feel like this is probably Kelly Testy's hand where she's like, you fix this now. This cannot happen. Yeah, uh, to her immense credit, she does always seem to be the most distressed by these things. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, – frankly, that's a compliment. I she like it. Knows. Yeah. She knows. She understands She it, cares it. though and I, I think that's one of the – rarest but best things that I can say about them over the years is there's somebody in charge now who really does seem to care. Yeah. She wants to get it right. And we've said this before and, and some people have been like, oh, are you sure? I'm like, yes. Spoke to her, feel very confident in, in how she feels about it. She wants this to go right. I feel strongly that it what happened in November was unacceptable and they all agree with that. So the beauty of it is though is that I had students yesterday who I was talking to who had problems and they were already being rescheduled mm -hmm. by the end of the day. I'm like, that's how you do this when there's a problem. I realize that's not always easy or even possible, but that should always be the goal. And I saw that happening. And for those students who did have problems, you will indeed be getting your scores back on the same date that everybody else gets their scores on. So, you, you don't get delayed. Yeah, let me clarify that. Those students who had problems and are going to take a makeup test, a January makeup, you will get your scores back at the same release date, which is February 6th, I believe, um, as everyone else. Here's the great news about many of those makeups, from cancellations to people who had issues that really just kind of wreck the day. They're doing makeups within a few days. I've never seen them do makeups this quickly, I don't think. And this is an acknowledgement of the problem. Yeah, there are makeup tests scheduled for this Thursday and this Friday. And I think if you take those makeups and they schedule it for digital, you'll take the same test. If it's a makeup that's much later than that, you might see a paper makeup. The good thing is, is the paper makeups they've been using in, in for recent exams have been fair tests. Yeah. So, yeah, it's none of these crazy ones. Yeah. I think you'll be all right one way or the other with that. Um. I wonder about that. Now, it's silly to speculate at this point, but I wonder if they'll use the same test. I know we probably shouldn't even get into it, but... I don't know. Yeah. I think if it's a few days, they probably will. Again, this won't be prejudicial either way, oh, so... I don't think so either. Let it go with that. Yeah. If you took the test and had an issue but completed it, let's say, you may not get offered a makeup. You may get offered a free repeat. You may get offered like a fee waiver, basically, into, say, February... If you're lucky, they'll fast track you or pro possibly March where they'll let you sign up for a future test for free. If that's the case, obviously, you won't be getting your January score at the same time as January people. I believe, and I think this is also case by case, but I believe they will also not count this as one of your takes if you had issues that was prohibitive. But like I said, I've, I've heard mixed reports on that from people. You know what? We'll clarify that. I'll talk to them about that because okay. that's a good question. I thought you meant you were going to clarify what I said, uh, which no. is perfectly fine too. One of your three, <laughs> you know, allowed takes within a year. I don't think this is going to count as one of those three strikes. As it were. I actually thought you were going to say, Dave, that's one of your three clarifications of words that I've said this whole year. <laughs> you just used one in January. It's, it's early January. I'm like, three? I'm going to use those this week. <laughs> All right. Let's go on and talk about the test itself. Cool. As always, we will make the same disclaimer we make every single time, which is that we are using information that is fully public. If we do think that releasing the information is too detailed or, or problematic, we simply withhold it. 
So we end up knowing certain things and seeing things about these tests that would probably allow people to figure things out. We don't release that because there are still people to take the test and we're trying to make it so they don't have an undue advantage here. So we're not going to talk about answer choices. We're not going to talk about specific question details. We're not going to talk about game types, game rules, solution strategies, how many variables were in a game, anything like that, how many questions on a passage. None of that stuff gets talked about, and that is because that information would start to be too useful for people who haven't taken it, and I'm not interested in giving them an advantage. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm interested in giving everyone an advantage, but... Yeah, well, I don't think we could necessarily like specify to the people who get this particular scenario, who get to listen to this before their test. That wouldn't be right. I, I mean, that's a great point. I'm interested in giving everybody the option. Like I wrote, a, you know, the LSAT Bibles because I was like, I want people to know this information and I think it will really help. But that means everybody had access to them. I don't want to give one single person information about a test that other people who took it didn't have. So let's make that distinction clear. Our yeah. business is to help people in a fair and above board way, do as well as yeah. possible on this test. It's not to give somebody a cheating advantage of sorts. Yeah, not that person, but all people. That's right. So this test, 101 questions, mm -hmm. 23 logic games, 27 reading comprehension, and then we had an LR of 25 and another LR of 26. That adds up to 101. Pretty standard. You and I spent a lot of time uh, reviewing information yesterday and a lot of you know time helping people figure out what was real, what was experimental. And I think, again, a lot of this information is on our LSAT form in a, in a very concise form. So if you're interested, go to the PowerScore LSAT discussion forum, take a look in the general questions section, and look for the thread about this particular test. Uh, we got a lot of information about the experimental logical reasonings and reading comprehension. Uh, the passages were there. Mm -hmm. I can see at least three different reading comprehension experimentals that were tested yesterday, which is kind of cool. So I can see what's going to come in the future. What did we not see, though, as far as experimentals? Well, this was the strangest thing is no one seemed to have an experimental set of games. Everyone who one talked about report. one person said one thing about one game that didn't match the rest. That was it. That was a, something about a circular game or something. But Yeah, circular seating game, I think, was how they referred to it. And I was like... No, well, there's no way they had another circle game. And then someone immediately was like, I had one game, I didn't see that. Yeah, um, it definitely wasn't real, but that was also the only, literally the only comment about an experimental game. And here's what I will say. That comment came in super early, <laughs> earlier than anything else, and I think it was a troll. Either a troll or it was someone who was asking it as a curiosity as opposed to like, I had this, did you? In rereading it, I was like, I wonder if this person was just asking if there was a circular game on the test. Well, discounting that particular report, I didn't see any other person or hear of any other person that had logic games. And that's the second time now in the past several tests that that's occurred. Mm -hmm. It was all LR and all RC as far as we could tell, which means they are in full production mode for the, I guess what we would call the squishier type of questions. <laughs> And apparently have a bigger library or catalog of the much more black and white, well-defined logic games that are out there. So they're really heavily testing these other ones. I find, it, I find it fascinating to watch this because if you're not paying attention, you wouldn't realize this. But if you are paying attention, it dawns on you during the day. I'm like, I'm not seeing any game stuff. I'm not having anybody who's having a difficulty knowing what the real games were. Yeah, I didn't see it either. And that's that was my takeaway too. It's like they're fine on games then. They've got plenty of games going forward. They yeah. need more RC and LR, which makes sense. Totally does. That's, I would say, much harder to make than a logic game. Logic game is pretty easy to make overall in my opinion. Comparatively so, yeah. Yeah, funner to make. I mean, certainly I've spent more time doing that than, than some of the other sections. So what's your take on the overall test according to what you heard out there? Not just what I heard, but I mean, every single person I talked to uh, was essentially classifying this test as exceedingly reasonable. Yeah. Nobody that I saw called it easy. I don't, or a couple people did, but they were immediately dismissed. <laughs> but as I was in September talking about the games, I think. Should have um, done it. <laughs> but everyone was like, I didn't find anything here to be like 
overwhelmingly difficult, or a lot of people were comparing it to the last several tests that they'd looked at, November, September, last June. And they're like, this, the games were easier than September. You know, the LR was easier than November. That's what I kept hearing from people. In a comparative sense, this test felt pretty standard, pretty fair and straightforward. Yeah, no one said to me, this was a really hard test. Mm -hmm. They said it had hard parts to it, which is true of every LSAT. Sure. But on the whole, nobody felt like the test overall was really difficult. Most people said it was on the easier side. And we'll talk about our scale prediction at the end. So if you were to, to break down the section types, LR, logic games, reading comprehension, which did you hear was the hardest? Oh, universally RC. I Agreed. mean, that was almost unanimous. That reading comp was the toughest thing on this test. Yep. By quite a margin for most people, I think. Uh, very big. I You heard a little bit of complaints about logic games. Uh, not a whole lot of complaints about LR. Occasionally, people were like, that question was difficult or I got stuck on that or what was the language there? But this was a test where RC was was clearly meant to be the difficulty area. And you know, again, we'll talk about the topics in just a moment. Logic games, not as much, more in the middle. And then logical reasoning looking to be more in the middle. And, and we'll qualify that as we go through here. So let's, sure. go through, let's go into the real content and talk about it and kind of break it down from the fact that um, – yeah, we have, we have all this, you know, this different content and, and topical information. So we'll start with logic games. Okay. As I said before, 23 questions. In the crystal ball that we did, we talked a lot about the focus on grouping and linearity. And again, without disclosing anything, that's what's on every LSAT. That's pretty much what was on this LSAT. I love so. it when we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> this, is actually, that was, this is one of the easier, safer bets that we make. It really is. I could go to the Las Vegas LSAT casino and score big on this bet, but the odds are not good. Uh, no, no. This is like, what would it be? 1 to yeah. 10, 1 to 50? This is a total aside, and for everyone else, I apologize. But <laughs> I saw someone on Reddit saying, oh, I took the LSAT at a Las Vegas casino hotel. And my immediate thought was, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I've got to hear about it. I loved her comment. She's like, I'm going to the bar directly afterwards. I was yeah. like, all right, you're my kind of person. But apparently, there were two of those comments. One, one took it at a hotel outside of town, and then was heading in to town. One took it at an actual casino in a conference room. Yeah, it was in Henderson. Um, that was the one. There was another one. I don't know if you saw it. That was complaining about taking it in a casino because all she could hear was like the jangling of slot machines and the people at the craps table screaming and stuff. Do, 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 do. Yeah, <laughs> she hated uh, it. The Henderson I think it was person, the Fiesta I think, enjoyed casino. Their time. And I think my comment was: is we <laughs> may need to move this podcast to that casino for all future dates. <laughs> I will say to both our credit, you and I were both very quick to jump in and comment on that thread. <laughs> it's all over that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait a second, is this at the Bellagio? Because my life <laughs> is about to change. But no, it was not. No, no, no. Yeah, there was one at a casino and then one outside of town who went to a casino post test for a cocktail. I think the post test casino was the Fiesta. I like it. Yeah. So anyway, let's move Vegas, on. Vegas aside, I saw this section, and I think you did too, as really a, a tale of two halves. Yes. In which I mean the first two games sort of stood apart from the last two games. This happens more often than people realize. Where you get this like uh, this split, this almost dichotomy of difficulty. Indeed. Yeah. The first two games, mostly what I heard from people was it was easy. Almost to the extent that they were non-memorable. Like people couldn't remember it. It was like I just burned through it and I went and didn't have too much trouble. When things get hard, that's when people start to remember specifically what has occurred. And the first two games were very nondescript. I mean, we know the two topics. One of them was that there were student presentations and kind of like school project assignments was one of the games. We know that the other game in that first group of two was about people traveling to various towns. But not a whole lot of complaints were made. Most people were like, love those. Those were no problem at all. So the first half of this section, really good overall. Yeah, good for a test taker, I think. This was a chance to really store some time to bank some easy points. This was... um. A favorable way to begin. Yeah, get ahead. You know, as you said, bank some confidence there. Now, the third and fourth games is where I started to see complaints and people remembering more about the game and feeling the difficulty more. Yeah. Let's talk about topics real quick because I think we maybe jumped over that. Unless you were going to circle back. 
No, I already covered it. You did? Student yeah. presentations, the people traveling to towns? Listen to the tape and you will find that I've oh already my. said that. I was, I was in Vegas world, I guess. <laughs> Were you taking a long drink of that Sawyer there? <laughs> no, I was taking short drinks at the Sawyer. I'm trying to take it easy on the gin. <laughs> you shouldn't. I'd like I to guess. see this gin Johnny. I'll be up there soon. <laughs> Are you going to meet me in uh, Las Vegas for the Super Bowl? I'm thinking about it. I've, I've got a ski trip that someone's kind of yanking on me to go do. Some mm-hmm. people are going to Aspen. Some people are going to Vail. I'd rather come hang with you in Vegas. You live a charmed life. Aspen, Vail, <sighs> Vegas. I live a Stretch Armstrong life, man. There's always somebody <laughs> yanking on some limb. <laughs> Well, let's get into these third and fourth games. So the third game was about senior and junior team members and the, some departments like leadership, management, and production. This game, I didn't hear so much that this game was super tough, but that it took some time. Yeah. You know, just like it was, it was, it took some time to work through and to, uh, and to get through all the questions. And that caused a secondary issue because some of those people weren't able to get to the last game. And the last game, by most reports, was the hardest of the four games. And this was a game, I mean, that honestly, from a topical standpoint, it's right up our alley. It was out <laughs> breweries and types of beer, yeah. like lagers and porters and stouts. And I, I'm loving that. This would be the kind of thing where I'd be like, they made this LSAT specifically for me. This is my <laughs> day. I'm crushing this. Yeah, the, the irony of this is that Everyone, for the most part, celebrates finishing the LSAT by going out and having some good beers. And I think so many people were put off by this last game that they struggled to <laughs> they struggled to come to terms with their, you know, desires. They suddenly went for cocktails or wine <laughs> yeah. or something like that. There was a lot of haagen last night, I think. Yeah, that's always the case. <laughs> the interesting thing about this beer game, though, which it will forever be known as, was that they have been testing this game for a while now. In June of 2017, it was an experimental game. In June of 2018, it came back as an experimental game. And so, they're clearly tinkering with it to get it right. And finally, it's shown up in a scored section here. And by all reports, not an easy game. Was it as difficult as, say, the Flowers game that we had last September or the fourth game on the November uh, LSAT? No. Nothing like that. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't re- reputed to be all that difficult. And also, it had hallmarks of prior games, apparently. Uh, and I'm not going to say, and nobody should ask me, what Don't. games that it Don't you know, ask. was similar to, because I will not tell you. I will say this. The section as a whole, it's funny you mentioned November. This was eerily reminiscent of the way that November was structured or laid out. The first game was really accessible and easy. The second game, I think, kind of, it didn't make or break, but it really gave you a huge advantage or held you a little bit back. And it was the third game where you could waste a lot of time. You could basically dig yourself such a hole that the fourth game, the hardest game, became borderline impossible. That happened in November. It seems to have happened again here. Now, you know, as as we talked about when we did that podcast in November, and, and I've explained that entire section on our forum as well, I love the November LSAT. I feel like for somebody who has studied past games and who is comfortable in what they're doing, that this is a section, November, that you could really smash. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is probably going to end up, you know, at some point in the future, whenever we see this test, if we it's going to end up as an exam where we're like, this is the kind of game where people who really spent a lot of time preparing for games were able to master this and do well. And just to kind of circle back to my comment about I'm not going to tell you which games the beer game is similar to. Remember that every game on this list is similar to some game in the past. Yeah. There are threads through history where you can go back and point to similar structures. So it's not unique to that game. There's not like, oh, if I look at prep test 51, that game is going to be the one. It doesn't work like that. Sometimes, though, games are much more similar to certain ones than other ones. And that's all I'm referring to there. Yeah. I'm still not going to disclose it and definitely not privately. So. But the nature, the flow of time management through this section, as soon as I started hearing about it, I was like, this is November all over again. This is the exact same game to game to game layout. Not in terms of topic, obviously, not in terms of setup, but in terms of like opportunity. Yeah. And, but it, it folds out really kind of optimally. Mm-hmm. You get half of the section done and things are going okay. That's at least a good start. That's what I really like to have is... And they've been doing this. The harder games, the more time-consuming games are often third and fourth. 
This is one of the reasons that people were so upset about September because the first two games were were time sucky. They were not easy, and people were like discomfited by the fact that they were halfway through the section, but they were way behind on time, and then they just didn't feel comfortable with it. Very different task September compared to November or this one. So yeah, this had November written all over it, from what I could tell. Yeah, and in that respect, you got a break because November is the the better games test compared to September. You'd much rather be similar to November than September. Let's go on to reading comprehension. Yeah, uh, although I'll make a, a comment to that. September would have been my preference, personally my preference. The scale was looser. The games were tough, but if that's your best section, that's what you want. Reading comp wasn't as hard, which again, a squishier thing that's harder. Ugh. September was right in my wheelhouse. Probably yours too, although you may not care. Uh, I'm okay really with either. I think in some respects that... <laughs> I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Ultraman. Um, there's, I've said this many times before, I want to enjoy what I do. November was a section that I really enjoyed. I kind of like got into it. I was like, these games are cool. It was more fun. September felt more like they're attempting to press me and I'm feeling more pressure. And I dislike that. I like to be comfortable. I've said many times I'm lazy. Uh, So for me, I think the November test was one that I probably would have been like, I would have enjoyed it more. So I would have liked it more. I think I would have liked this test quite a bit as well because I would have felt like, got it. I'm doing this. It's looking good. Oh, I like what they did there. That kind of thing. I would have had that continuous stream of conversation with myself where it's all pretty positive versus you got to move faster. Watch out. They're trying to screw with you here. That conversation during an LSAT is one that I don't enjoy as much just because I'm like, I got to work harder. Yeah. Let's talk about what I don't enjoy, which is reading comprehension. All right. I think that would have been the part of this test. I would have liked this test on the whole from what I've heard, but I think reading comp here, I would have been like, oh, come on. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I'm generally like that anyway, but certain sections less so. This would have been a like real groaner for me. I don't know. Go run through the topics. All right. Just as a general thing. Sure. And then let's talk about that point that you just made. Because I'm going to disagree with you slightly, but let's just see. Shocking. Uh, before I run through the topics, let me once again circle back and self-congratulate. On our crystal ball, here's what we told you would be on this test. There's likely to be two humanities, a law, in a science. Dave, what was on this test? That exact <laughs> uh, arrangement. That precise, yeah, composition. It started with a law passage, um, which had to do with the internet and regulating crime, illegal activities, basically. It moved to humanities, um, and I, I don't feel bad labeling these as what they are, versus games calling them linear grouping, advanced linear, that sort of thing. I don't want to do. But passage two was humanities. This would have been a a chore, I think. Um, It was a language exchange passage about Native American tribes essentially trading back and forth like on Mobilian. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Jargon uh, and pidgin language and why it was that Mobilian somehow survived this back and forth. I think despite pidgin maybe being a more dominant form. Then Uh this is something I would have greatly enjoyed because I know a little bit about it. A science passage about lifespan uh, and gene senescence, which is how you say that word. Um, indicators of aging. Thank you very much. Telomeres, biomarkers, longevity. And I think they measured this with uh, markers in flies. Do you know what senescence is? You know, I must admit that I don't. But you're about to tell me I can sense Sarah you very strongly. said yes, I'd have been like, no, here's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I said yes and I was lying, you would have done the, the appropriate thing, which is, like, great, oh, cool. then you tell me what it is. I'd be like, yeah. no, John, today's it? your day. <laughs> Um, senescence is essentially the the downward curve of the bell curve of your life. So you've got like the maturation phase and then you peak wherever that happens to be. Senescence is that slow, relentless march towards death. It is the aging deterioration, mostly a deterioration in your cell's ability to maintain fidelity as it divides and copies. Cells get worse, DNA strands get worse at matching correctly. That's where cancer comes from. That's what senescence is. Great. What an upper that is. Yeah. So, as I was making those Sawyer cocktails the other day, here's a complete aside. I was walking past something, a bookshelf or something, and a book caught my eye. It's one I haven't read in years. It's a book called Mortality by Christopher Hitchens. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. He wrote it after his cancer diagnosis in kind of the weaning months, years of his life. And it's really an uplifting, but really sad book. Because here's a guy who's kind of staring death in the eye, this guy who's been a 
really fierce presence. And uh, he, there's a line in it that reminded me, I mean, it was before the test, but it reminded me of senescence when I heard the line. And the line is this, that the trouble with aging is that every day relentlessly demands more and more from less and less. And I was like, damn, Christopher. Getting <laughs> deeply philosophical yeah, think about me, that one. He's right, but that's essentially what senescence is. Senescence. This is why I drink so much. <laughs> well, I think that's what ended up getting him. So, <laughs> extra energy to combat those effects, pernicious yeah, effects of aging. I don't like a them. monster. Um, but anyway, if you ever get a chance to read any Christopher Hitchens, I highly encourage you to take it. And then the fourth passage, again, much like the fourth game, the hardest according to most people. Another humanities passage. Uh, this one on artwork forgeries with Van Meegeren and Vermeer. This is also the comparative passage on the test. Uh, what I found maybe most interesting about this wasn't so much the topic, but its sibling, essentially. They have used this same topic, not the same passage, I don't think. I can't imagine because it was a single and now comparative. It had similarities, though, there that were, were definitely unmistakable. Overlaps. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I should say where it was. I think it's okay. This it's has been easily, widely discussed it's online. It's easily found and it was, you know discussed yesterday. Yeah, this is everywhere online, so I don't feel too bad. But uh, the second passage from October 2010, which is PT61, was on Vermeer, or Van Meegeren and Vermeer, and basically Meegeren forging Vermeer's signature on his own art to try to yeah. gain like notoriety and acclaim. Oh, and if you, could, yeah. if you ever look at the two artists side by side, it's not even close. Meegeren was a really bargain <laughs> basement copy, <laughs> at best. Like, well, from across the room, you could be like, that one's better. If I recall, Vermeer was not exactly prolific, so uh, you know, copying a few of them would bring in some good money. Here's my take on this section, uh, and obviously your description there, we're both in accord on that, was that the, it ended with the most difficult passage set. It was the comparative one. You were talking about how you didn't like it, and yet when I look at this section, all right, this international cybersecurity and regulation, this sounds interesting to me. You know, obviously, we live in the age of the internet. We've certainly had to deal with a lot of kind of like cyber issues in terms of what we do. I feel like just from a comfort level with that passage, it's right up my alley. I like legal related stuff. I enjoy getting into it. I think I would have killed the first passage. The second one, this Mobilian jargon and, uh, you know, the tribes and the kind of like the lingua franca is really what they're talking about, if you know what that means, John. Lingua the, franca. Uh, Yes, yeah. of course I do. Damn, I just wanted to get you back after that senescence <laughs> crack you made on me. Sorry. It's like the common language. If you have right. a native language, but then you have to talk to somebody else who does not, uh, who has a different native language, and you come up with kind of like a common a native way tongue, to exchange, that's yeah. lingua franca. But that's almost like this mobilian jargon, the pigeon, it kind of and why it survived. I don't know. I feel like this could have been difficult to read, and I heard that there were some challenges to it. So... I'm pretty good with humanity stuff and certainly language is something that interests me. So I feel like it would have been okay. The the one about like the, the science of aging, this probably would have been the most challenging to me. It's your strength. It's not mine. Uh, that's why I don't know the meaning of that word Senescence. very well. Okay. Now I'll never forget it though. Yeah. Senescence. But now you give me a lesson on it. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and then I love art and uh, Vermeer and so I would have – I would have been, I think, fine with the last one. I know the language was dense. Uh, I hope to see it at some point in the future, obviously. But I feel like that's right in my wheelhouse. So I feel like when I look at this section, it feels it feels like it would have been okay. I probably would have been most concerned about that third passage. Yeah. And I probably would have skipped it and done it last. As soon as I saw that it, what it was about, I'd have been like, I'll deal with this later on. There's something to be said to that. A guy asked me on Reddit, like a person asked me on Reddit, um, about that when it came out that there'd been this other passage uh, very similar to the fourth passage here about art forgeries and Meegeren and Vermeer, where he was like, do you think someone would have had an advantage if they had read that thing from October 2010 previously? And I was like, you know, I think anyone who's maybe even remotely familiar with a topic has an advantage innately because they're naturally more comfortable. They're not having to learn this stuff as they go, or at least they feel like they've got a toehold from the outset. That's how I feel about a passage on senescence, or senescence, depending on the pronunciation. 
Oh, now you're changing it up. I don't I've heard it down both ways. That. But Do you really know what you're talking about here, or are you just kind of like pontificating? <laughs> I'm just me? making stuff up as I go. I knew it. I, I'm just, I'm counting on no one researching what I say. Please, everybody research it immediately. It's in essence. Um, but yeah, I was like, look, anytime you run into something that you've either are aware of, or you've studied or know a little bit about, of course, it makes you feel a little more comfortable with it. I don't know anything about Mobilian jargon in Passage 2, so I would have been like, what? I'd have been fine, I think. But it would have been one of those things where I felt like I was having to pick it up as I go, as opposed to feeling instantly like, oh, I know about this already. There's no doubt about that. You know, like Vermeer, I can walk into a passage like that and have and be very comfortable with it. Sure. I already, you know, I know he's Dutch. I know it's like the 1600s. I've seen a bunch of the pictures. I'm, I'm really sure you and I saw plenty in the Rijksmuseum. And, you know, Indeed, we've been there. We've seen it. That was. But the thing is this, even if you haven't, what you need to know is in the passage. And that's the same thing with the Mobilian jargon, is that even if you don't know it, it's going to be there. And that's the key with reading comprehension. It's yeah. really easy to be overwhelmed by the topic, but what you need to know is there. I just look at something like the uh, the Science of Aging one, I'm like, all right, I know it's all here, but it might get a little bit complicated to keep everything tracked properly. That's Agreed. all. And that was the second point that I made to the person. I was like, the good news is familiarity is not a, a necessary piece here. It's not a requirement. They're going to give you everything you need. Will you feel a little more comfortable if you're like, hey, I know about Vermeer? Sure. But can you get to that level of comfort if you just read the right way? Well, yes. I mean, this is a perfect example. You'd rather do four science passages. I'd rather do four humanities passages or law passages. Really simple. Yeah. And not every humanities or law passage is easy and not every science passage is harder. But on my free time, I'm not reading a whole lot of science stuff. So that's the difference. It's not my inclination. And one of the things that you see in reading comprehension is, is that when somebody runs up against a topic that they feel comfortable with or that they enjoy in their, you know, kind of like their daily life, they automatically tend to perform better. Yeah. And then they run up against a passage that they're not as familiar with or it's not a topic that they enjoy. It's more of a struggle. It's not impossible. It's just harder. Yeah. You have to work harder to get there. Exactly. What do you read in your free time? Like Peppa Pig or – I don't know anything about children. Is that that's a book? Not a, that's not a book, no, dude. It's know. a TV show. I just hear it from parents. <laughs> SpongeBob? That's a show, I think. Uh, I'm not – SpongeBob's not my jam. I will I will talk with some authority on Peppa Pig because <laughs> if you have a child under the age of 10, you will have encountered Peppa Pig. Here's a funny story. <laughs> Peppa Pig, who is a British kind of like animated cartoon. It's cute. Oh, uh, okay. Um, there's just funny things in there. They do. They like to run through muddy puddles and things like that. Anybody who's a parent right now is like nodding. There's a funny thing though. There is – it's it's really big worldwide. Uh, and in Australia, there is one episode that is banned. You can show all the Peppa Pigs except for one episode. It's the episode where she makes friends with a spider. And that's because in Australia where everything wants to kill you, uh, oh. <laughs> making friends with spiders and teaching like four and three and five year olds to make friends with spiders is actually really bad policy because it could be a huge problem. So when they realized what she was doing, like, oh, it's a friendly spider, uh, they're like, they don't show that to Australian kids. So you try to, you know, mess with me on Peppa Pig, I'll put you in your place. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a book. So. Clearly, I'm in no condition to argue, Peppa. <laughs> You're out of your depth, son. All right. <laughs> I'm definitely out of my depth when it comes to anything with kids under 10. You know one. That's You know two of them now. Uh, yeah, my, my little sister's got one. Yep. Way under 10. Your sister's kid and my daughter. Mm -hmm. All right. What's left? Logical reasoning. Logical reasoning. And the thing that's most interesting here is how unnotable this was. Yeah. You didn't see people coming back saying, I couldn't do this question. You know, this question about, the, you know, the difference between mind and brain, for example, was impossible and everybody's complaining about it. You really saw kind of like very meh kind of response to it. And again, we've got lists on our forum of like what the real questions were, questions that are basically experimental and so forth. Here's a couple of the real questions. The difference between mind and brain, which you just talked about. Um, being barefoot versus using shoes, which apparently was a very interesting question. Yawning monkeys. I heard about that one over and over. 
Yeah, there's a lot of different monkey questions going on right now. There's something about chimpanzees and a different question. Uh, I think it's an easy area for them to mine for content. And someone's clearly an expert, so you're seeing a lot of questions on that. Um, something about curb parking and whether it's legal after 7 p.m. And then last, LDL versus HDL cholesterol, which is kind of obviously a little bit more sciencey. And there's other topics that are floating around. There's questions about like um, a different type of cholesterol. There's DNA. There's evergreen trees. Things, things that were just kind of like the typical topics. But yeah. I never heard anybody say I couldn't do this. And that is a really great thing because it means that 50% of the scored sections of this test were pretty reasonable. And you add in what we've already said about logic games and reading comprehension. That's not bad. Yeah. That's that is why it lines up to be a. I think a fair test. A yeah, when people walk out of the people. test and I ask them about LR and they're like, they make that noise you did, which is just kind of like, nah. That's exactly what I want to hear. That's the best sound you could yeah. possibly hear yeah. in relation to I that I mean, section. followed by like, I think it was fine. Not like, meh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> meh, I think it was fine. It wasn't too bad. I feel like I did well. I finished the sections. That's what I was hearing from people about this test. Nondescript again. And nondescript can, go, man. can cut both ways. If somebody comes back and they're like, I don't remember anything about the test, I'm like, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. That could be something where it just is like, well, it, was, it was all really kind of like middle of the road and not that difficult. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Or I was so stressed and rushed that I don't remember anything. That is bad. Yeah, so, but a collective amnesia is usually a good sign. Yeah, because that means it's more the middle of the road and yeah. no big deal. And uh, that's certainly the case here is that LR seems to be fairly straightforward. And so yeah. this test lines up in a, I'd say overall, on the easier side, in a really kind of like positive alignment. Were there some tough LR? Yes. Was there some, you know, a tough reading comp passage? Yes. Was there a tough logic game? Yes. Was that difficulty as high as you've seen in just the past year for any of those sections? No. Mm -hmm. I think mean, yeah. that's probably the best summary of this test. I should have just said that at the that beginning was, and that no, would have that been the perfect. end of the podcast. That was Jeez. perfect. And I think what that's going to translate into is a lot of people, I, again, fingers crossed, this is maybe the optimist in me. He doesn't come out all that often. But I think a lot of people are going to be happy with their scores here. The well-prepared, I think, are going to find this to be a pretty favorable outcome. Part of that is going to depend on the scaling. Scale. Yeah. So let's move to that. This is the last big piece that we'll talk about here. We came out midday yesterday relatively quickly. I think the earliest I've ever predicted a scale was about 30 minutes afterwards. <laughs> I waited a little bit longer this time. Um, but again, we were both on the same page. This official scale prediction we have made is that you can miss 10 questions to get a 170. Yeah, that's now, 90, 91 questions right. Well. 91 questions right, miss 10 to get a 170. We use that number because that's the upper level marker. A lot of people are trying to get to 170. It's a really easy kind of shorthand notation to think about, well, how hard was this? Well, then the question is naturally, where does minus 10 fall on the scaling? It falls on the easier side. Well, it, it, the easier test side, the tighter scale side. Yeah. Is, and, when your scale is tighter... Let's, let me reverse that. When you have an easier test and it's easier to get questions right, you have a tighter scale. When you have a harder test and it's more difficult to get questions right, they loosen the scale up. You might see a minus 13 scale as we've seen recently. This one, uh, I'm, I feel decent with minus 10. I think that would be great for most people. If we see a minus 10 scaling on this, it would be fantastic. If we had to change this, John, and I know, again, we both are in agreement on this. Which direction would you change it? Would you change it to minus 11 or would you change it to minus 9? Oh, I hate the answer, but I, I would tighten it. I would say it would go to minus 9. Yeah, if this isn't a minus 10 test, I would say it's a minus 9 too. Which again some, speaks to the overall favorable nature of the content, the accessible nature of the content. People got more questions right on this test than they would have, say, in September on the whole. That's exactly right. And, you know, sometimes people hear after the test like minus 10 or, oh my God, it might be minus 9. First off, the test is in the books. You've done the questions. So, that's nothing to really worry about. What this really is, is a reflection of what you did. It's not like they come in afterwards and they're like, oh, we're just going to arbitrarily do this. We know this and, you know, get really close on this frequently because 
we're listening and examining what was actually used on this exam. And everything that we're seeing is minus 10. Maybe minus 9? We're not going to know, unfortunately, because this is a non-disclosed test, and I would expect it'll be years before we see it. Yeah, I've said this to people before. I may have said it in an earlier episode that the reason we make these scale predictions is not so much for this exact number, but because the number quantifies, in a way, our sense of the overall difficulty. If we're saying something like minus 9 or minus 10, what we're really telling you is this was not a very hard test in the grand scheme of things. If we're saying minus 12, minus 13, what we're saying is that test was rough. It's harder. Yeah. And so to me, this just gives a numerical value to those slightly more like amorphous terms, hard or easy, but quantify it. It's That's a reflection. That's what this does. Yeah. Yeah. It's an inverse reflection of the logical difficulty of the test. Hard <laughs> test, all right, looser scale. <laughs> Easier test from a logical standpoint, tighter scale. That's how that's the equation. That's how it works. So, in a sense, we're not really predicting. Okay, this is the exact scale. What we're doing is we're talking about the fact that this is what kind of difficulty we saw from this exam, and it is imperfect. You can look at scales where the upper part of it is very loose, and then it tightens up in the middle, and that's telling you something about the difference between upper level difficulty questions and mid level difficulty questions. You can also see, you know, really tight scales in the middle, and then they often tend to loosen, or tight scales at the top, and then they tend to loosen up in the middle. Yeah. That That's means a really there were fewer really, really hard questions. A scale yeah. where you can miss more at the top means there were a bunch of questions that hardly anyone got right. Mm hmm Yeah. But again, it's not just like, oh, this is the whole test. There are people scoring at different levels, and the scaling is matching that as they go through this. So doesn't change a whole lot for somebody who's scoring 155 to know this because it's probably they're still running into the same amount of mid-level questions. But it's an interesting thing to talk about because the real difficulty at the top is what this reflects, the hardest of the hard questions. And this test didn't have as many as, say, September. Yeah, for sure. Well, unfortunately, we will never know. Or at least if we do, we're going to really have to wait for it. Um, you and I will probably learn about it in like five or eight years, but everybody listening to this is going to be like, Elsa, I never want to look at that thing again at that deep, point. Deep in the grips of senescence. <laughs> senescence. Um, senescence. Senescence. You don't know. Senescence. Well, I've heard it pronounced both ways. I think the actual official way is uh, senescence. Look, dude, but earlier in this podcast, you said this is the way the word is pronounced. Now I, I discovered never... <laughs> that is not necessarily the way the word is pronounced. So I'm questioning said, everything you said. This is how you pronounce it. Period. I never said that. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I think the <laughs> actual way, the, the official tape. way is senescence, but senescence is mm -hmm. not uh, outside the vernacular. The reason I say that we won't know for a while, if ever, is because this, like the next several tests, is regrettably non-disclosed. January, February, March, April, all four of these uh, are going to be basically kept in the vault. You'll see your score. You'll see its percentile. You'll see nothing else, unfortunately. Um, not until June of this year will we actually get another hard copy LSAT. You'll get your score band, woo. <laughs> that just means can you add and subtract two or so? <laughs> Three. Three is hard. <laughs> but yeah, that's all that is. <laughs> so no, it won't be disclosed. Scores will still be coming out on February 6th. Get asked this all the time. You think scores will come early? No. No. Not anymore. That used to be the case in the past. And for those of you who had to endure it, it was hellish. It is far, far better for them to pick a date and at rough time, which is 9 a.m. Eastern time, and start releasing the information then makes things so much easier and yeah. so much less stress and heartache it's because a lot of times people were just like paralyzed for a couple of days waiting for scores to show up. Yeah, you're going to sleep great on February 4th now. Yeah. Because Previously, you know, you you know, know there's not. no chance you're waking up to an LSAT score. Exactly. The other thing we'll mention is that if you haven't done the writing sample, just as an applicant, uh, or if this was your first test, uh, go ahead and get on top of that. They're still having problems. We've talked about this, this in our other podcasts. Um, if you don't have one on file, you do need to add one in. Start earlier because it's still quite hit or miss with them. And I will mention this. We did a podcast on that topic. It's episode 15, if I recall correctly. So check that out. And, you know, the last thing is this. If this test went well for you, excellent. You know, this is what you want. This was a reasonable test. Hopefully you did well. If you didn't, regroup and prepare for either, you know, the March or April or later test. Or if you're 
signed up for February, prepare for that and get help. You know, one of the things people often tell me is like, oh, I wish I'd studied harder or I listened to your podcast and I heard you guys talking about these various things, but I never did anything. Remember, this is just a reflection of the books we've written, the courses that we teach, the students that we tutor. There's always a way and a method for you to get assistance, whether it's to get a book and read through that. You can read something like the Logical Reasoning Bible in two weeks and get a lot of information from it. Or work with a tutor or take a course. You can change your future by preparing properly and you can get a lot done in a month or two. So keep that in mind. You're not just stuck with where you're at. That's what we do here. We're happy to help. We're here for you. I've got nothing to add to that. Damn. I know. I'm on it. You are. All right. Well, let's call it a day then. Interesting test. Wish I could see it. Won't be for a while. So we'll take it that way. We'll be coming at you soon. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you find it. Give us a rating if you don't mind. And then also, if you have any questions, we'll be doing a mailbag at some time soon. Send that to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, have a great week. 